Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about why creativity matters. I'm delighted to welcome special guest Fiona Valentine. Fiona is a business coach for artists, the host of the Confident Artist Facebook group, and the creator of the Profitable Artist Method. You can reach Fiona at her website, fionavalentine.com, and I'll include a link in the description. Welcome, Fiona. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Thank you. Me too. I'm so glad to be talking with you. I am excited to be talking about art and creativity, and I already mentioned to you that my daughters are artists, and so this is going to be wonderful as I learn some information that will help them. But before we get into that, I would really love to hear your story. You left these little tantalizing tidbits about raising your first child in a mud hut in Africa (laughs) with no electricity and no running water. So there's a story here. Would you mind sharing? That really happened. I know it's hard to believe some days now that I'm living in comfortable suburbia and have been here for a long time. But um, I actually met my husband on a missions trip and he's American. And we went back to Africa after we were married, uh, which is where we originally met. We ended up working with nomads in a church planting role. So we were living in a small village where the buildings really were made of mud. And although we had our house was sort of configured like a three-bedroom home. It was we had bathroom fixtures, but no running water, so it was very interesting. We had a little bit of solar power, but um, we lived in these pretty extreme circumstances, about fifty degrees most of the time. And yeah, that's where we brought our first baby home. When we were looking for somewhere to live in this village with our co-workers, we were literally wandering around like Mary and Joseph. I was nine months, well, eight months pregnant. <laughs> you have to be completely covered in that culture, you know, head coverings, and there are donkeys everywhere, and it was quite bizarre. We had our baby safely. She was a very healthy child, thankfully, and it, it was really a wonderful experience the year and a half or so that we were in that part of Africa. Then we came home to Australia and raised our girls here. So, But that experience was really quite formative for me around creativity, so I'm, I'm glad we're talking about the, these topics today. Yes, and you mentioned that For a while, you thought maybe creativity doesn't matter because you're working with real people in situations where there's poverty and there's lack and there's so much need that you thought maybe, maybe creativity doesn't matter. Maybe art doesn't matter. Maybe that's frivolous. Maybe what only matters is that we, you know, eat and have water and have food and have shelter. And now you've kind of come around where you say, yes, of course, those things are important, but that doesn't mean that creativity isn't important. So will you kind of walk me through that process of... Yeah. I think it's so important to look at our ideas around creativity because I think there's, there's a strange thing. Books have been written about it. Just there's some kind of opposition to our creativity. And it's so important to understand that it's how we're wired. Actually, 50% of people don't believe they're creative, which is astonishing because the reality is 100% of us are. We're born with it. But like most of our potential, it needs to be developed. And so understanding how it fits into the whole whole scheme of things is so important. And I guess being young and not having anyone around me who could speak to me about creativity in a way that made sense to me, it was easy to think it just, it felt self-indulgent. And I think a lot of people feel that even if they're not in a situation where they're seeing poverty or suffering, maybe they see it on the news. So maybe some of the things that are going on in the world make them feel like their creativity is frivolous in light of suffering. So I think it's really always, no matter where you live, um, something to think through and in actual fact even women living in those situations I couldn't see it at the time but they were enjoying their creativity in simple ways decorating their cooking utensils embroidering their clothing making things for new babies it's part of what we do and God doesn't have any problem with calling it work (laughs) if you look through the Bible there's a lot of examples of God speaking specifically about creativity and referring to it as work it's really important to him and obviously you just got to look at the sky to realize that the way he does things is beautiful and creative. And we've been made in that image. So understanding this is fundamental to who we are and it doesn't go away in a time of suffering. It may change, 
but creativity, it, it's not just about painting and drawing, is it? We, we need creativity in science, in math, in manufacturing, in problem solving. But creativity in the arts is particularly unique, perhaps. Um, we bring a giftedness and a value in a way that brings comfort, brings beauty, brings joy. And in a time of suffering, those things are really important. And even the actual process of making, I don't know if you've ever embroidered or done knitting or things like that, but those simple processes or drawing with a pencil, they put us in a really good headspace. So the actual process of making is good for us and the, the thing that we make is incredibly valuable. Art communicates without words. So it's able to hold beauty and memory and story, all sorts of things, and communicate without words. And we notice it even as children. So it's changing our homes, it's changing our workplaces, it's providing an unspoken comfort in healthcare environments and it's just important on so many levels, but I didn't see the importance of making as part of my well-being, and that's something that I, I came to learn over the years. Wow, isn't that lovely? And it's the same concept, creativity, and yet we can come at it from such different angles of, oh, this is frivolous, oh, this is necessary, oh, this makes life better. And the way that we view things kind of... It influences the way that we feel about it or vice versa. The way we feel about it influences the way that we view. And so I love yeah. that you brought up so many reasons why it's beneficial. And I love that you brought up that even when you were in Africa, in these very primitive circumstances where the basic needs are food, shelter, water, we want to make sure that our babies are healthy. We want to take care of these things that they valued the art as well and the creativity and how it, it makes our lives more fulfilled. And, and that is part of what is joy. Joy is feeling that level of fulfillment. And I also really appreciated that you mentioned that there are different forms of creativity, that it's not only in the visual arts because you have wonderful talent and my girls have wonderful talent. I do not. I can paint walls with a roller and that's about it. But I do value the beauty that they, that my girls create. And also I have learned that my creativity still is counts as creativity, even though it's in different forms. For example, today you and I are creating this podcast. We are coming together to share our ideas and to share the things that matter to us so that we can share it with other people and hopefully help make their lives better. And I, I appreciated learning that that counted as creativity. Otherwise, I felt like I totally missed the boat. It, for sure. And I think that's the reason why 50% of people don't think they're creative because they're just not recognizing it because it's there and the ad lib that goes on in a live conversation that definitely takes some creative skills. One of the things that's really nice about drawing and painting is that it's very learnable. And you can pick it up easily. And the act of doing it, of learning how to draw, how to paint, it builds these pathways in your thinking and creativity transfers. So if you become confident in one area, you're going to be much freer to dive into another area, feeling like, oh, I can learn this. And even if it feels un uncomfortable in the beginning or I'm terrible at it in the beginning, it doesn't matter because I'll get better because I remember when that happened before. So. I like to use art with business and help people who are involved in continuous improvement programs unlock the creativity of their teams by teaching them how to draw. And when they see, oh, my goodness, with some training, I can go from not being able to draw stick figures to being able to create a beautiful classical drawing of a foot. How, how did that happen? They realise it was just step by step. It was just training. And that it's unlocked this creativity they didn't even realize they had. And that understanding then sets you free to apply your creativity to problem solving in any field. That is brilliant. I have not heard of that as being a business tool to help unlock creativity. Love it. That's absolutely amazing. So it just, and I love how you talk about it transfers from one place to another. 
So if we learn these skills, and it is a skill set, not just an innate gift necessarily, then yes. it transfers to something else. So even if we don't think, you know, maybe I don't, I'm not really interested in being a professional artist. I, but still that process of creating, even in the visual arts, can apply to whatever it is that I want to do. Exactly. Yes, it's so valuable. I first noticed this teaching adult painting classes on Tuesday nights. And I would see, I often worked with absolute beginners who'd never painted before. They just had an interest. But I started to see that for some people, having a go, trying, uh, was really challenging. They felt quite locked up and there was a lot of almost mindset issues sort of holding them back, making it a struggle. Whereas others just dived in boots and all. They didn't necessarily have any more obvious ability it was a confidence and I found I started to find out that some of these people who were able to dive in listen to what I said have a go and just make fast progress a couple of these women have been doing cake decorating and the penny kind of dropped for me that uh aha they'd been learning to mix color for icing on cakes and they learned to struggle through and you know make some messy cakes and then come out with some that looked really terrific and through this process of cake making, they'd already exercised their creativity. So jumping into painting really wasn't that difficult. And it's it got me thinking that, aha, uh-huh, this really does, this creative confidence transfers. And the more we know about the brain, the more that's just absolutely true. That's reinforced. Yes. And you mentioned earlier how it makes those new neural pathways, which is mm. so cool. And isn't it interesting how when we're in situations where there's something new we can either dive in, boots and all, or we can feel terrified. And I think part of the reason we feel terrified is we think, well, my value is based on the, the end result. If, if my painting doesn't turn out well, then somehow that makes me less of a person. And, and it's uh, a visual evidence of my failure. That's the thing about drawing and painting is it's there for everyone to see. And we're all experts at looking And so people tend to feel quite free to say what they think about (laughs) this painting or drawing. And and kids do it to each other. There are a lot of messages that can be taken on, even in primary school, around your drawing. If you don't have an obvious talent or gift that's evident in your drawing, then it it can be quite crushing when, in actual fact, it's not really about talent. And often it's the person with less talent who's got a really tenacious ability to keep practicing, who goes on to actually do something with their skill rather than the person who had a natural talent but perhaps doesn't have the ethic, the work ethic, the desire to really keep going and persevere. Oh, isn't that interesting? Then it feels more accessible. Like if I really wanted that, mm. then maybe I could do it too. Yeah, there's nothing stopping you. And I think that's probably the most important thing. If you have a desire to build a business doing something creative, then knowing people have been doing that for thousands of years. Women have done that while juggling home and family for thousands of years. It's possible. And I love just unpacking some practical ways for artists particularly to do that. Yes, please. Let's go in that direction. Okay, so we've talked about how this can help really anyone And now let's talk a little bit about helping artists because you help them take uh, an interest and art is often not very profitable. In fact, I've heard statistics from another artist. He said about 95% of artists live at the poverty level. And I don't know if his statistics are accurate or not, but the idea is uh, when you're thinking of a career, people don't put artists at the top of the list if they're hoping to make money. And so if you found a way yeah. to help people be successful that way, that's, that's really helpful. It is helpful. And really it's sales and marketing. And some creative people are really <gasps> reluctant to even go there. And there, there is a, an unhelpful kind of thinking for lots of reasons that somehow to think about sales and marketing diminishes your creativity or your authenticity as an artist and really it doesn't there's a kind of humility that recognizes that being an artist isn't that different than other trades it's okay to be reimbursed 
for your effort, for the value that you bring society. We don't expect plumbers and doctors and farmers to work for free. And artists don't need to work for free either. But having the humility to say, I'm not that different than these other roles, I think that's a helpful position to take. It's different and there is something special about art, but there's also something ordinary about work that's just wholesome. And so if you can see that to be an artist who doesn't starve, an artist who thrives, that that's going to take thinking like a business person. Then you put a different hat on because for most artists, even if you've got a fine art degree, you don't step into employment unless you're doing something around the arts that's not actually creating it, you're likely going to be working on your own and that that means that you're the one that's going to have to take charge of the income side of things. So if you can apply your creativity to that entrepreneurial side and see it as an extension of your creativity, then on the mindset level, that's a really great place to start. Once you've made that leap, that if artists starve, it may be that they're making work, but they're not doing the work of getting that work out into the world profitably. They're missing the business piece. So you've made that leap. Now, okay, so how do I do it? Well, it's so individual. If you can start off, I like to start off with clarity. How much time do you have to give to this? What, how much time would you like to spend? And that's often a different question for women if they're going to be mothers or they are mothers. There's that factor in there where we have a different role. So how much time do you have? How much time do you want to spend? How much money do you need or want to make? This is a really important one. So if we don't hold on to the belief that artists can't make money, which isn't true, there are many artists who are making a living. And in fact, in the age we live in, the internet has made so much possible. So it does, it's not a necessary thing. It may be a common thing, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible. It's very possible. So how much money do you want or need to make? And then the third question to ask yourself is, what do I love to do? And get really specific, not just make art, but which medium, which style, which subject? What feeling? And I encourage people to start with their personality. Don't make art that you think will sell. Make the art that really resonates with you somehow. What's your story? Where are you from? Where have you lived? What colors really appeal to you? Do you love texture? Are you impulsive and impatient and you just want to slap paint around and texture and liveliness appeals to you? Or are you methodical and you just love the thing that gives you a thrill is realism? and arranging the painting and really communicating something very specific. Whatever your personality is, let that drive your what do you love to create choices and get specific. And then you'll know, aha, uh-huh, if I love this, who, you know, who else can enjoy that? They're, they're going to be my customers. But you take those three pieces, time and money and what you love to create, and where they overlap you look for the highest value offer you can create. Wow. So I encourage, yeah, it's it's profoundly simple, isn't it? Yes, just creating that beautiful Venn diagram where I have this circle and this circle and this circle. Where do they overlap? That's lovely. And then that creates, now does that, that's where you focus your creativity, but that's, we're not focusing our sales there yet, are we? We're just getting clarity because your clarity is going to affect your creativity. That's what's happening in the studio, moving from idea to finished painting. So if you realize the, the figure that's your annual figure that you're trying to work on, so let's say you were aiming for $80,000 a year. That's what you needed to pay the bills, to contribute to daily necessities, to look after your family. Then if you look at the art that you're making, you may realize that selling $25 products on Etsy is going to require maybe 3,000 items. That's a lot of sales. But if you flip that, selling 25 $3,000 paintings, that is far fewer sales. So when you're looking at your highest value offer, you're getting really clear on what kind of work can have the right kind of price tag to be able to achieve your financial goals. And then that is going to drive your creativity. That's going to direct what you're making in the studio. If gift cards aren't going to cut it, 
it's going to be larger work or substantial work or a particular kind of offering that's unique to you, then you're going to know exactly what you're working on. And if you're, I encourage people to work in four collections a year. So if you're working towards a quarterly collection and you, you've done the work to figure out the time and the money and the focus, then when you turn up to the studio, you know what you're working on and it gives real direction to that creative process, which actually is a really joyful thing. Wow. So you've created a framework for uh, what I'm going to create, how much I'm going to create. And it gives me a kind of a a deadline, a self-imposed deadline that within these, this quarter, I am going to produce this much uh, art. Now, for those who are able to, you know, put something up quickly, uh, the the, the texture, the colors, the uh, more of an impressionistic are going to be able to produce more in a small amount of time than the example you gave of someone who is very yes. detail oriented and working on just making things realistic. So I, I guess you have to include that in your figures. Exactly. And you may find that you end up doing some of the work that you are most excited about this very detailed methodical work and it has a higher price tag that reflects the time and the care that have gone into it and you also may experiment with making some kinds of work that are faster for you and that's okay and that there are ways to do that and there are also ways to include prints in the offerings limited edition prints things like that that extend uh, your work and your working hours and licensing, things like that. There are other options. But doing this planning work on the front end will really help. And once you've got those clarity and creativity mm-hmm. in place, then you can move on to the connection. And this is really the sales and marketing piece. And this is where you've identified who loves what you do and can afford to pay for it. And then where are they? And what are their needs? What are they looking for? Are they looking for art as a way to a beautiful home? Are they looking to create a certain feeling to nurture their family and to provide relaxation and restoration? Are they looking for something in a commercial space? Are they looking for something that holds their memories? Maybe they've sold the family farm. Maybe they've lost a beloved grandparent. And there are places or treasures that the family want to share. And so a memory painting can hold the scenes of the farm or it can hold these objects that are treasured by the whole family. And not everybody can have that favourite clock or vase or whatever in their home, but you could all have paintings of those favourite sacred um, memory-holding objects, things like that. When you know who you're serving then you know what's important to them and you can learn to articulate the value that you bring. So I help my clients to build a marketing ecosystem, a simple website, an email list, because that's your number one asset, staying in touch with your collectors and potential collectors, and then sharing that on social media in a way that's consistent and authentic and who you are and an extension of your creativity. But it also doesn't you know, you're not spending your life scrolling on social media. You've got a really specific plan to share the preparation of this collection, the launch of this collection, and a way for people to buy it from you. Wow, that's lovely. The simplicity of the clarity and the connection. And how do you find the, the, the people that your art resonates with, that, that it's going to fill their needs and their wants? How do you locate them? It really comes down to sort of once you've identified who your ideal collectors are, getting to know them and thinking about where are they likely to be. So if you're in a particular local area and you're painting that local area, then you would know, okay, are people going to find you painting on the beach in the park? Are they going to find you because there's a favourite shop with a great shop window and you could display some of your work there is there a festival where those people are going is there uh, a favorite restaurant they go to so actually being physically seen in some of those places might be helpful but you can also ask yourself what magazines do they read where might I advertise there where are they hanging out online are they on Facebook are they on Instagram are they on LinkedIn depending on who your clients are 
what magazine, I think I already mentioned what magazines they read, um, all that sort of thing, what are they doing, what are they looking for, what's important to them and creating messaging that's speaking to that particular group of people. And that those are really learned skills. That's a process of um, thinking as the other person does and speaking right to their needs. And obviously that message needs to be wherever they are. So it's really, uh, that's where you're applying your creativity. You're really doing this investigative process. That is lovely. And these are the concepts and the skills that you teach in your courses, right? Your, your profitable um, artist uh, groups method, and probably yeah. off method, sorry. And then um, through your, your Facebook group, you provide, I'm assuming, the encouragement and information and let's have a community and help each other to be able to, to do this and to be successful. That is yes. lovely. And they can reach you on your website? That's right, fionavalentine.com, and you'll see that there's a free guide there on how to start selling your art, and you can download that uh, free guide. And the Profitable Artist Method is a 90-day program where I take people over three months through this process of building a simple business and marketing system to sell their art. That's beautiful. So we're taking an artist, somebody who has already knows what they want, has yes. gained those skills, and then you say, okay, now here's how to be able to get that out into the world yes and even if you're feeling oh am I ready I can work with you the thing is you never really feel ready it's about getting ready so I teach art skills as well and have programs and courses for that so if you're feeling like you're on the borderline of wondering "Ooh, am I ready for this let's jump on a call and have a conversation because chances are with a few tweaks you can be very ready and you can build your portfolio at the same time that you build your business well, isn't that lovely? And you don't feel like you have to wait. You're, you can get mm. started. Beautiful. That's right. Well, Fiona, thank you. This has been delightful. Well, thank you, Linda. Lovely talking with you. Yeah, same here. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Pablo Picasso. He said, every child is an artist. The problem is staying an artist when you grow up. Today, I invite you to be creative and stay an artist, even when you're a grown-up. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller You Got This, an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.